Thank you very much. We turn now to general questions. Our first question is from Gordon Lindhurst. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to help boost Scotland's exports. Minister Ivan McKee. The Scottish Government has embarked on an ambitious course of action to grow Scotland's exports. A trading nation represents the most comprehensive analysis of Scotland's export performance alongside market opportunity ever undertaken by the Scottish Government. We seek to grow the value of Scotland's exports as a percentage of GDP from 20% to 25% over the next 10 years. Resources will be directed towards delivering export growth and forcing a step change in performance to deliver a resilient, internationalised and inclusive economy. We are bolstering our existing support with an additional £20 million of investment over three years. This investment will be maximised by focusing on the sectors, markets and businesses where our efforts and those of our delivery partners can have the most impact. We will monitor progress and keep our actions and evidence under review. Gordon Linders. Page 73 of the recently published Scottish Government's plan, A Trading Nation, discusses the importance of air routes connecting to Scotland's international markets, including Edinburgh Airport. It accepts that Scotland has fewer direct long-haul flights than similar-sized European nations. Can the Minister comment on the effect his government's U-turn on air departure tax will have on the ability to attract these routes, which are so vital to increasing exports? Minister. The Scottish Government recognises the importance of air routes to grow in our economy and our exports, as clearly specified in the plan, but we also recognise the fact that there is a climate emergency. The work that we are undertaking, both in the economy portfolio and with our environmental concerns to the fore, is to ensure that we deliver both to meet the requirements of the climate change emergency and to grow Scotland's economy in a sustainable way, built uh, to a not insignificant extent among the significant expertise we have uh, amongst renewable energies as an export, exportable commodity. And Fulton McGregor. No, sir. The Minister will be aware of the recent food and drink statistics which put the value of Scotland's industry exports at over £6 billion. Does the Scottish Government agree that this progress in growth is put at risk by the Brexit pursued by both the Tories and the Labour Party? Minister. Uh, indeed I do, um, and Brexit has is, uh, is got the capacity, to, uh, the capability to impact right across our economy, particularly on our export sector, and a sector like food and drink, um, as, as we all know, is very much dependent on um, so supply chains to market um, and rapidly getting product to, uh, to customers, so there's a significant risk to that sector and many others by the reckless behaviour of Conservative and Labour parties with regards to Brexit. Question number two has not been lodged. Number three, Lewis MacDonald. To ask the Scottish Government on what grounds Transport Scotland has failed to reveal which further option or options it has abandoned for duelling the A96. Cabinet Secretary Michael Mathis. As is the case for all major road projects, it's important that we maintain transparency throughout the route selection process and that we provide everyone with an interest and equal opportunity to view our plans and discuss them directly with the project team. The member is fully aware that public engagement events are due to be held from the 28th to the 31st of May, which will give local communities and road users the opportunity to see and comment on the options being taken forward for further assessment. To ensure that as many people as possible are aware of the events in advance, they have been widely advertised with approximately 3,500 invites having been issued to everyone who has expressed an interest in our proposals which includes the member. Lewis MacDonald. The Cabinet Secretary, and he is well aware of the environmental impact and cost of building a modern dual carriageway where no such road exists at the moment, and that most of the, op most of the options Transport Scotland has been considering involve a whole new route for the A96 between Huntley and Contour. Given his own prediction that duelling the A96 will cost the taxpayer uh, four times as much as the AWPR, is it not time that Transport Scotland looked for an alternative approach that would minimise environmental impact and command public support? Cabinet Secretary. Um, I don't know if the member has tempted me to say that we should abandon the uh, duelling of the A96. I'm sure that's not the case. However, um, of course, the environmental assessments are a key part of the route assessment process, which is uh, being undertaken, uh, and these will be taken into account um, before a final decision is made on the preferred 
uh, route. In terms of the uh, wider environmental agenda, of course, as the First Minister has already indicated, we are looking at um, a whole range of different policy areas across government, including within my portfolio, about how we can address some of the wider issues that address our uh, climate uh, change challenge. But I can assure the member that environmental impact assessment is a key part of the decision-making which will inform the decision around the preferred route option. Gillian Martin to be followed by Peter Chapman. Gillian Martin. Thank you, President Officer. Last month I asked the government if the traffic flow as a result of the completion of the AWPR would be taken into account in the assessment of the best route for the dual part of the A96 from Kintore and Viruri to Huntley. Can I ask how long this assessment is going to take and what importance has been placed on it as a preferred route decision is reached? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, to an officer, the, given that the AWPR is now open, there will be traffic surveys undertaken in the coming weeks and the data which is collated from that uh, will help to inform our decision in making a choice on the preferred route by the end of this year. Peter Chapman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Cabinet Secretary is well aware there is a very strong feeling in the Inverurie area that dueling the existing road around Inverurie is the best and the most cost-effective route to upgrade the A96. Why has this option been ruled out and why has the Cabinet Secretary refused to meet with a group who are pursuing this option? Cabinet Secretary. Mr. Officer, I'm uh, aware when you undertake a major infrastructure project like this, you will have uh, different groups of individuals who will have different opinions um, on what the preferred route should actually be. Uh, but as part of the engagement process which has been undertaken this uh, May by officials within Transport Scotland and their consultants will set out the details as to why uh, they have rejected some of these uh, particular proposals. A particular one in terms of the online upgrade, which the member is aware of, um, having raised this matter before, is because of the impact it would actually have on existing residential premises, uh, which would be affected by uh, a loss of uh, their garden areas and also, in some cases, their properties altogether. And that's why it was one of the routes which was uh, ruled out. But what I can assure the member of is that as a government, we are committed to making sure we improve the infrastructure in the northeast of Scotland, as we did with the AWPR, as we're doing with the upgrading of the line between uh, Aberdeen and Inverness with a £300 million rail infrastructure investment, and also with the upgrading of the A96 to make sure we dual the route between Aberdeen and Inverness. Question number four, Angus MacDonald to ask the Scottish Government what discussions it's had with the National Federation of Sub-Postmasters regarding additional charging of non-domestic rates for external ATMs at post offices. Minister Kate Forbes. Duration of sub-postmasters about non-domestic rates for external ATMs at post offices and they specifically commended Angus Macdonald's support for the Federation in that conversation. This afternoon I wrote to them regarding the valuation of ATMs in post offices but I'm happy to answer any specific queries the member may have. Angus Macdonald. I thank the Minister for a reply. Whilst I acknowledge that under the Community Empowerment Act each local authority has powers to create rates relief to reflect local needs. Does the Minister agree that acknowledgement should be made at government level of the increasing contribution local post offices are making in the wake of significant local bank branch closures? As post offices uh, effectively become the new banking facilities for the respective communities, does the Minister agree there should be more recognisance of that fact? And a start would be to stop classing external ATMs as another business, adding extra financial pressures on some postmasters of more domestic rates when, in fact, ATMs are already integral to the post office services. Minister. Well, Angus Macdonald is right about the importance of post offices to local communities and economies in Scotland, particularly in light of bank branch closures. And that's why we do have some reliefs in place already, particularly for ATMs in rural areas, which are exempt from rating. And that includes buildings in which the ATM is situated if the building is used only for the purposes of the ATM. And there's also relief to post offices in rural areas and post offices with a rateable value under £8,500 that are the only post office located in designated rural areas are also eligible. But I'd be happy to discuss any specific current concerns that Angus Macdonald might have, particularly in his more urban constituency. And Bob Doris. Uh, President officer, a post office in my constituency in Postal Park requires to pay rates on the ATM at his premises supplied by Bank of Ireland. Now, these ATMs are the only machines that customers with a post office card account can use. They can't use any others. Does the minister agree with me that the pocket card ATM can be a lifeline to the most vulnerable societies, such as pensioners, the disabled and families on benefits? And therefore, minister, 
would you request an urgent review of the rateable value on such ATMs as business costs levied are effectively passed on to local businesses that are providing a vital service? And if these ATMs are withdrawn, it's my constituents that will suffer. Minister. Thank Bob Doris for that question. I absolutely understand the importance of those services to Bob Doris's constituents. And if the Scottish Government can do more to help, then we will certainly consider that, with the caveat that rateable values are set by independent assessors and the Scottish Government has no remit to interfere in that process. Nevertheless, if perhaps Bob Doris and Angus Macdonald would like to meet to discuss their specific constituency uh, issues, then I'd be happy to do so. Thank you. Question number five, Maurice Corrie. <coughs> thank you, President Officer. Uh, <coughs> to thank the Scottish Government in light, uh, to, to ask the Scottish Government, sorry, in light of the potential impact on the local natural environment, what its position is on whether the proposed development at Lowman Banks near Ballock is an acceptable proposal for a national park. Minister Murray Gujar. As I'm sure the member will understand, ministers cannot comment on the specifics of this proposed development as it is a live planning case. Maurice Corrie. I thank the Minister for her reply. Nevertheless, tourism, tourism does not mean that we have to have commercialisation at the expense of the quality of life of local residents. Surely the Minister would agree with me that the Loch Lomond and, National, and Trussex National Park must put residents of Ballock and area first and foremost, particularly when Visit Scotland's trend document, which states that Visit Scotland recognises that, and I quote, friendly locals add to a tourism experience and living in a tourist area has an impact on people's lives. Minister. I would simply defer to the member to the initial answer that I gave him and just to say that I'm sure that Loch Lomond and Trossex National Park will consider all relevant information uh, pertaining uh, to this case because I would emphasise that it's for the National Park Authority as the relevant planning authority to determine the application and any development must be in keeping with the statutory aims of the National Park and compliant with Scottish planning policy and the development plan. Jackie Bailey. Scottish Enterprise purchased the land for the proposed development about 20 years ago at some £2 million. Now I understand that they intend to sell it for £200,000 to Lowman Banks, a significant difference. Indeed, Lowman Banks are likely to receive a grant, um, so public funds could be used to pay them to develop this area. Does the Minister regard this as an appropriate use of public resources and will she consider with planning colleagues whether to call this application in which would provide confidence in the decision making process? Minister. Again, I would refer the member to my initial answer that this is a live planning case and I, can't, I simply can't comment on that. And if there are, and again, in relation to her second point, that would be a, a point for the, the planning minister to look at rather than myself. If there aren't any particular issues that uh, Jackie Bailey would like to raise, I would urge her, I'm sure she already has submitted a, 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 to, a put in a comment to the, the planning application as it is at the moment uh, and to highlight these issues. Question number six, Maureen Watt. To ask the Scottish Government how the draft neurological action plan will help people with ME. Minister Joe Fitzpatrick. We want to ensure that everyone living with ME in Scotland is able to access the best possible care and support to live well on their own terms. That's why we've made it a priority through our programme for government to implement Scotland's first national action plan on neurological conditions. This has been produced in collaboration with the neurological community and will be published in final form later this year. Maureen Wood. I thank the Minister for that reply. I have a very courageous 17-year-old constituent who, despite being diagnosed with ME and having missed substantial periods of school, has gone on to pass six of their National 5 exams and hopes one day to attend university. They have expressed concern that ME is not included in the action plan. Therefore, can the Minister take this opportunity to reassure my constituent and others that their opinions will be reflected in the final report? Minister. First, firstly, I'd like to congratulate your constituent on their exam results and wish them the very best for the future. The National Action Plan from neuro for Neurological Conditions is not condition-specific, encompasses all conditions, including ME, and is a broad approach which aims to make improvements for everyone, regardless of the specific neurological condition they live with. So we are currently reviewing responses received during the, the recent public consultation. We want everyone to fully embrace the action plan and to recognise that it does represent their condition and circumstances. 
Therefore, we'll take on board the feedback that we've received and endeavour to ensure that the final plan is clear throughout that it is in, in its intent and scope it is for all neurological conditions, including ME. Miles Briggs. Thank you, President Officer. I agree with the points Maureen Watt uh, just made, but can I ask the Minister what discussions have the Scottish Government had with ME charities and other stakeholders about how to increase the current levels of funding around research into ME? And would he agree to meet with me and the charities to discuss how we take this forward? Minister. The, the, the Scottish Government is, um, frequently meets with a range of stake, stakeholders, but um, if, if Mr Briggs um, wants to have a, a discussion about this specifically, then um, we meet on regular occasions, so I'm sure we can include that in our next, in next meeting. Very good. Question number seven, Rhoda Grant. To ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to support health services in rural areas. Minister, sorry, Cabinet Secretary Jean Freeman. Uh, we are supporting rural general practice with a comprehensive package of measures, including increased investment in recruitment incentives and relocation costs for GPs moving to rural posts, investment to support IT improvements and to support rural dispensing practices, together with investment to support GP uh, recruitment and resilience schemes and the new GP contract negotiated and agreed with the BMA, which aims to uh, provide a more attractive career in rural and urban practices by enhancing the GP role as expert medical generalists supported by a multidisciplinary team dedicating more time to patients who are in most need of their skills. Rhoda Grant. Following the Sturrock report, Employees in a number of health boards are now raising similar concerns about bullying. My constituents in the Western Isles are raising worrying concerns with me and are keen that their situation is also independently investigated. Can I ask what steps she has taken to investigate bullying in the Western Isles Health Board and also what comfort can she give to my constituents about these allegations and how they're going to be dealt with in order to create a safe working environment for them? So, of course, I would share uh, Ms Grant's commitment to the creation of an increasingly safe working environment for our staff in the health service. Um, I am aware of uh, the me recent media reports and have had some discussion with the Board of Western Isles on the three uh, individuals, the three allegations of bullying. If Ms Grant has other uh, allegations from constituents that she wishes to raise with me, then of course I will look at those very seriously. The Stark report itself, whilst focused on NHS Highland, as I said in my statement at the time, produces significantly important points for us to consider across our NHS. We will consider individual situations as and when they arise, but, but equally importantly, we are pursuing the work that I outlined in my statement to ensure that across uh, our health service in collaboration with our rural colleges, our trade unions and recognised employee organisations and with the regulatory authorities, that we continue to take the steps necessary to promote a positive working culture in the NHS. Question number eight, Joan McAlpine. To ask the Scottish Government when ministers last met the UK Secretary of State for International Trade and what was discussed. Minister Ivan McKee. Uh, the then Cabinet Secretary for the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work met the UK Secretary of State for International Trade on 2nd November 2017. They discussed the UK Trade Bill and the involvement of the Scottish Government in developing future UK trade arrangements. Additionally, I, along with the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Economy and Fair Work, are due to meet the Secretary of State on Friday of this week. We will take that opportunity to impress the importance of Scottish involvement in the negotiation and approval of any future trade deals that may be signed by the UK post-Brexit. Joe McAlpine. I thank the Minister for that answer. Uh, the Parliament's Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Affairs Committee recently took e evidence from expert trade negotiators who told us that it was vital that devolved administrations were consulted ahead of any negotiating position being reached on future trade deals. And they also said that the UK government ought to be able to exclude Scotland's NHS from any future UK-US trade deal. Has the UK government engaged with you on those particular matters and do you expect them to? Minister. The, in answer to the question, the UK Government has not engaged with us on uh, those specific matters with regards to Scotland's NHS 
and I can reiterate, reiterate the Scottish Government's position that we would be strongly opposed to anything that opened up our NHS or any other aspect of our public sector to unwanted interest from businesses that might seek to privatise or otherwise challenge some of those services. And that underlines and highlights the critical importance of uh, Scottish engagement in the uh, process of negotiating trade arrangements by the UK Government going forward. Thank you very much. And that concludes general questions.